Um, thanks everybody for coming. I'm Jeff O'Hanley from Otsego County Conservation Association. Looks like everybody, just about everybody is muted, which is great. We should have some a great program today. Um, I will turn this over to Wendy um, and just remind folks that uh, you can ask questions um, using the chat bar at any time. I do believe we'll be holding questions toward the end of each presentation as we go. Uh, Wendy, do you want to get us started? Sure, thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. This is Wendy Walsh. I'm the watershed coordinator for the Upper, Susque Upper Susquehanna Coalition. I just wanted to welcome you to our third session of the 2020 Upper Susquehanna Watershed Virtual Forum. As you know, current circumstances do not allow us to meet in large numbers or in person. So in place of our annual watershed forum this year, we've decided to hold a series of mini sessions focused on conservation efforts within the watershed. These sessions have been put together by the USC Education and Outreach Committee, along with the Otsego County Conservation Association. All sessions are recorded and can be viewed from the USC website. If you have ideas for future sessions, please let us know. We're looking for more topics. Today's focus highlights a project of the USC wetland team and our partners. The wetland team continues to be actively planning, designing, implementing, and monitoring wetlands in the watershed. One project is our Hellbinder work, which is the focus of today's mini session. Mini session. The USC wetland team and TWT partners are here today to present on the Hellbender stream habitat restoration work that we've been doing. So I will turn it over to them. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoy. Hi, good morning. This is Jeremy Waddell. I'm the uh, wetlands biologist for Upper Susquehanna Coalition and we've been uh, really fortunate over the last few years to be involved with this Hellbender restoration project. Um, the uh, first uh, thing I want to emphasize is the partnership approach because uh, conservation uh, uh, priorities like this are rarely uh, achieved without um, a broad network of partners involved to assist with um, a multitude of components. Um, so without the cooperation of Lycoming College and SUNY ESF, uh, the Bronx Zoo, the DEC, uh, the, upper, the USCA and Clean Water Institute, um, and the Wetland Trust, of course, uh, this project would uh, would be difficult to um, to accomplish. So, just a brief background on the Hellbender, the geographic range. We are at the northern end of the Eastern Hellbender Range. Um, its uh, populations are quite abundant in uh, the southern portions of its range, and in New York State, the populations are rather stable in western New York. The, uh, the Susquehanna Basin hellbender populations are, uh, are what would some would characterize as at a critical level. Uh, some of the historic threats to the eastern hellbender include overcollection and deliberate eradication, which is still uh, unfortunately ongoing today. Uh, water pollution, war waterborne diseases, um, and habitat loss. Uh, a major component of the conservation uh, effort into the Hellbender is uh, 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 land acquisition and, and protection, habitat protection. Um, so it's been a major focus of the Wetland Trust to acquire properties that are adjacent to or in the vicinity of known or previous or historic Hellbender habitat. And through funding, uh, through the Fish and Wildlife Service with the Richardson Hill landfill, the Wetland Trust was able to acquire two separate parcels uh, of land that uh, occupy the, the known uh, Hellbender location. So this uh, was a critical component in uh, achieving the perpetual conservation and, uh, and protection of the property. Uh, here's a quick view, a drone photo of the Reaches stream where we have been focusing the habitat restoration and uh, and some additional efforts to reestablish forest cover on the riparian zone is on is going to be ongoing through this area. Um, we were able to source flagstone at a nearby quarry, um, and as part of the Richardson Hill funding, we were 
uh, able to uh, move the slab rack up to the property and in cooperation with SUNY SF and like Cumming College and DEC and uh, all the partners, we were able to identify areas where we were able to receive permits, um, Article 15 permits to install the, the slab rack um, for the hellbenders for the uh, prior to the release of the, of the first cohort of hellbenders. We rented a telescoping forklift, and some of those stones were uh, small enough in size to be able to be managed by hand, but many of them had to be lowered into the stream. Um, and uh, the project was was fairly successful. Michelle had some uh, uh, some of the released hellbenders were occupying the habitat uh, post release, and so that was encouraging. Um, we are going to be installing additional uh, slab rock in 2020. I just received the permit yesterday uh, from Region 4 DEC to move ahead with the installation. The stone has already been mobilized to the site, and so we're just going to be picking a window of low flow conditions when it's conducive uh, and works for everybody, and we're going to uh, install the, the second phase of the, of the cover rocks um, at the upstream reach. Uh, uh, and, and that parcel of land was uh, previously under negotiation at the, at, at, during 2018 when we did the first project. So um, we're excited about expanding the, the cover rock project, and uh, we hope that there's going to be uh, uh, additional uh, utilization of that habitat by this next cohort of released animals, uh, which is at the Bronx Zoo now. And uh, Michelle Herman, who's a biologist with Well and Trust, has been uh, spearheading the effort of of uh, rearing and, uh, and the mark and recapturing. And so uh, she has some more information about that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle. All right, hi everybody. I, um, as Jeremy said, I'm Michelle Herman and I'm a biologist with the Wetland Trust. And I've been mostly in charge of the captive rearing and field monitoring of the hellbenders. So I'm just gonna very briefly give an update on that. Um, so as Jeremy already touched on, um, the basic components of this project are population augmentation because there was a pretty severe crash starting um, in the mid-90s or late 90s and we don't really know why so we want to restore this population and then there is a field monitoring component um, and then there's also habitat enhancement as Jeremy touched on through installation of artificial habitat structures or huts and then the slab rock and to date, we have uh, successfully reared and released 99 juveniles. They went out in August 2018, and I have been out in the field monitoring them ever since. Um, so for the Head Start monitoring, uh, we do this mainly through pit tags. We inject a pit tag into the base of the tail, and with a tag reader, it works much like a metal detector would. You just wave it over the rocks and it'll give you an ID of an animal if it's under that rock. So we're able to monitor these guys with fairly little disturbance to them, which is nice. And uh, pictured here is my, my uh, floating workstation with all of my gear for monitoring these animals. So uh, once they went out in 2018, we've been trying to get out as often as we can. And we do a full reach scan of the area where we release them and just try to cover the entire stream bottom and uh, record who is still there because we want to know where they're going um, and whether they're utilizing this habitat that we put in for them. And we also try to capture the animals at least once a year. I give them a, a brief health assessment. Um, I measure them, I weigh them, and uh, 
I also swab them for chytrid fungus because that's a big concern with not just hellbenders, but amphibians in general. It's a, a, a widespread disease that infects their skin. And then um, the other side of the coin is that um, through all this habitat restoration and monitoring of these released juveniles, we're actually finding that there are some adults left at this site, which was really exciting. So um, there is this long period of time starting about in the mid 90s to up to 2014 where there were sporadic rock lifting surveys and only three adults were found during this period, which was um, very depressing. It was thought that maybe they were going to be extirpated from this area. Um, but since we've installed these huts and started to check them since 2017, um, we now know of 11 adults at the site, eight males, uh, three females, which is really exciting. And they're utilizing our huts um, very often, which is really great to see. And then um, through these huts, uh, we're also finding that there is still some reproduction occurring at the site. And with the nesting, it's, um, it's a great opportunity because with these huts, we are able to um, collect a portion of the nests and we can hand those over to our partners at the Bronx Zoo, uh, which we have a cohort there now, about 130 animals. Or um, we can leave a portion of the nest to just naturally hatch in the wild. Although, while we know that the larvae successfully hatch in our huts, we have no idea what happens to them afterwards. Um, so it's still a bit of a mystery as to why we don't have recruitment. But to date, we have had six nests and huts among, I believe, four males, which has um, exceeded our expectations, I would say, for a population that was believed to be extirpated. So just to wrap this up, um, in the future, we are, of course, looking to bring in the second wave of juveniles from the Bronx Zoo. Um, the Wetland Trust has a state-of-the-art rearing facility where we're able to give them different water and diet treatments with these six recirculating tank systems. So we're hoping to get them in this fall and they will go out next year in 2021. And we're also exploring different monitoring techniques. So in addition to the handheld pit tag scanner, we have some um, other means we're trying, we're trying to put these miniature tag reading devices in front of the huts themselves to monitor animals going in and out. Um, and then we also have these massive cables that we stretch across the stream bottom and they are able to read, um, you know, if a, a tagged animal crawls across the bottom, they'll automatically record that so we know if our animals are actually leaving the study area. And I'll also continue to uh, monitor the huts for nesting activity. Um, we'll possibly keep collecting more eggs. And uh, ultimately, we just want to know um, what the population size is, where these animals are coming from, why there's low recruitment. And uh, with that, I suppose we will turn it over to questions, um, or if uh, Wendy or anybody else would like to step in. Thank you, Michelle and Jeremy. We do have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, Melissa asks, how are the cover rocks used by the hellbenders? So we've had um, a few instances of juveniles utilizing the slab rocks. Um, the slab rocks are essentially placed in between two historical reaches with natural habitat. So the only habitat where those placed rocks are is just those placed rocks. So it's more of a travel corridor right now. Um, so we don't have really sustained long-term use, but we have had, I would say, about a half a dozen or more cases of our place or uh, released juveniles utilizing these rocks as they move back and forth between the natural reaches, um, which is what we were hoping to achieve for now since there was so little habitat there to begin with. Okay. Um, I asked how big are the hellbenders when they are released? When they went out, they were, I will say roughly eight inches long 
And right now they are more like um, roughly a foot long, I would say. Okay. Uh, Jim has asked how much space between the rock and river bottom and does high water ever dislodge the rocks? Um, well, the hellbenders need very little space underneath these rocks. They're uh, very soft and squishy, you could say. Um, they can crawl under incredibly tight spaces and they make like a very, very shallow cavity underneath the rock. So they don't need much space when we place these rocks. And um, so far the rocks have been fairly stable. We had a pretty bad flood in fall 2018 that dislodged a few, but um, these are pretty massive rocks, so it would take a lot to significantly shift them. Uh, Melissa also asks, why is there such a limited amount of habitat in the stream naturally? Uh, well, the butternut overall is um, it's a very uh, agricultural stream. Um, uh, it's really kind of a odd that there's rock there at all where we're working. Um, it's very different from the vast majority of, of the system. So, um, yeah, it's, a, it's kind of just a, a small island of habitat um, where otherwise it's, it's fairly slow and silty with not a lot of um, substrate for the hellbenders to utilize. And I would just add to that that um, one of the you know key components of uh, of the hellbender habitat is uh, you know mature uh, dense riparian forest cover, um, and and those are the areas that um, have the highest densities and have the right conditions. You know, um, the hellbender itself being a kind of a keystone species, an indicator species, if. Um, that of, of high water quality. Um, so I think that speaks to the butternut uh, in general. Um, I think it, it, it's, a, it's a probably comparatively speaking to the rest of a lot of the uh, water bodies of equivalent size is probably one of our highest quality watersheds in, in the Susquehanna drainage. Um, and so, um, but over time and, and, through, and through land use, um, sedimentation, siltation has ultimately led to the demise of, of the cover rocks and the, and the historic natural habitat has been lost through siltation. And have, have you seen, uh, are, I mean, are there hellbender populations in some of the other uh, tributaries in, in, you know, say Otsego County? I, I had heard a report a few years back, somebody said they found some in Otego Creek, and I wasn't actually sure if that was the case or not. Uh, there's, um, there was some eDNA work done several years ago, about 2014, that returned a few positive hits in some other streams. Um, uh, there's, those have yet to be confirmed, those other places, because there are no hellbenders actually cited um, at those locations, but there was a positive eDNA signal, which is not always 100% reliable, but um, it is possible. There are some stray individuals in other creeks and rivers, but the numbers are just so low, it would be very hard to detect them. Great, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Wendy, should we turn it back to you? Sure. Um, I just want to thank everybody for participating today, and um, we appreciate your attendance. And I'll be sending out a leak of the recording, so if you want to share that with others that were maybe unable to be on today's um, mini session, that would be great. And next week, our focus is going to be on the stream team and a project in Shimon County that will be presenting um, same time, 9.30 on uh, July 29th. Thanks everybody for participating. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.